things easier up there. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> Seen a few more people stroll in, so we'll go ahead and uh, get started. Make sure we try to stay on time. Um, up next, uh, we're going to be talking about a, a topic that I'm really interested in: is uh, um, protecting health information and research, mental health, and genetics. I've been working with a lot of uh, researchers in the past uh, three or four years who, who have definitely taken to big data, and they think it's extremely important, uh, as uh, uh, most of industry has. Um, but they don't seem to have the same kinds of uh, resources in order to protect that data. That that they are now collecting in much larger uh, numbers. So this um, particular panel is going to be led by Mark Rothstein, and we will let him uh, take over from here. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Rothstein from the University of Louisville School of Medicine, and it's my privilege to be the moderator for this session. And looking at the topics, you might ask yourself, well, what do these three topics have in common? research, mental health, and genetics? The answer is, they are things that interest me a lot. <laughs> uh, and I was fortunately able to uh, convince the planning committee, uh, with little effort, I might add, um, to have this panel this afternoon. The other question you might have is, well, what do these four people at the table have in common? And the answer is, they are four of the leading experts in their field, and it's something that you will soon realize. We're going to go in the following order. You've got introductions in your material, so I don't want to infringe on their time by going through that. Uh, we'll begin with uh, Professor Souter will talk about genetics, and then Devin McGraw on mental health, and then we'll have two presentations on different aspects of health research, uh, beginning with Allison Ryan and concluding with J.J. Neatfeld. And they'll each speak for 10 minutes, and then we should have some time left for questions and maybe even some time for answers. So, Sonia? Are you using slides? I am using okay. slides. Then we'll flip to here, and then you can go ahead. Uh, wait a minute, where am I going to find them? something when the Okay. Well, um, thank you, Mark, for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, I'm going to jump right in because 10 minutes goes by quickly. I want to talk about personalized medicine and genetic privacy. There are many issues to discuss. I'm going to um, just try to cover a few of the key issues. I'm not going to have all the answers, but um, I'm going to raise a lot of the problems. Um, so personalized medicine has the goal of trying to tailor preventive health treatments or strategies based on individual differences. And how we understand these ind individual differences, or at least the goal for doing that, is to look at variations along the genome, variations in the products of the genome, RNA, protein, and other information like family history. Now, to get from genomic information to personalized medicine, the goal is to try to understand the molecular factors that underlie disease pathogenesis. And if you can understand that, there's the hope that you'd be able to figure out who's likely to develop a disease and possibly be able to develop therapeutic regimens that are tailored to the unique biology of the individual. Now, privacy issues arise both in the clinical context and in the research setting. There are actually a huge number of issues, and I would have loved to have spent a lot of time on the research side, but since we have two people who are focusing on research, I'm going to only briefly touch on that and focus more on the clinical setting. So in the clinical setting, as I said, we want to look for differences among individuals, and so the goal is to collect a great deal of different kinds of molecular information, and I'm focusing on genetic information. So one approach is to do genetic tests. That's what we've been doing traditionally. I was a genetic counselor for many years, and when I was a counselor, we tested many people to find out if they were carriers for conditions that put them at an increased risk of having a child with a recessive disease like Tay-Sachs or sickle cell anemia. Just as I was leaving genetic counseling, which tells you how long ago that was, mm -hmm. uh, the testing started to move towards, towards testing for disease susceptibility. If you had a family history of certain cancers or neurological conditions, there was the possibility in some cases to find out if you had an inherited susceptibility. 
But we're now moving into an era of something called whole genome or exome sequencing. And this is where you're analyzing the entire genome, sequencing the entire genome, as opposed to focusing on one gene within the genome or one tiny part within the gene. Um, or exome sequencing, where you're looking at the parts of the genome that code for the proteins that play a role in disease. At this point, we're using whole genome or exome sequencing in the clinic mostly to make definitive diagnoses when somebody has a rare, unusual condition or to try to guide treatment. But one could imagine in the future that whole genome sequencing becomes much more a part of ordinary clinical care. Um, as the price drops and as the accuracy of sequencing increases, I think this will become a very routine part of clinical care. Whether it should, when it should, how it should would be the subject of an entirely different talk. I think it's a complicated issue. Um, and then there's pharmacogenomics testing, and I think this is what most people think of as personalized medicine. This is trying to look at variations in the genome to understand whether a person is likely to respond to a disease or not, what dosage requirements would be appropriate, or whether there are any possibilities of adverse events. And so the goal is to minimize harm and increase the efficacy of pharmaceutical treatment. So, I'm talking about a lot of different kinds of tests that collect a great deal of genetic information. And I want to just take a moment to talk about why we care about the privacy of genetic information. And there are really a lot of reasons. The first is that much of the information, not all of it, is sensitive information. If you can identify that somebody has a risk of a future disease or a susceptibility towards certain behavioral traits or mental illness, that's sensitive information. It's also deeply personal. It tells us a lot about who we are or who, who we, what we will become. Now, it doesn't tell us everything because the environment plays a strong role with genetics in influencing what happens. It's also familial. If I find out that I have a susceptibility to an inherited form of cancer or a neurological condition, then my children have an increased risk, my siblings. It's relevant to my close biological relatives. And so for all of these reasons, for the last several decades, people have been very concerned about discrimination on the basis of genetic information, particularly in the health insurance world or in the insurance world or the unemployment um, context. And also, the information is potentially stigmatizing, potentially for groups or for individuals. And so because many people fear the misuse of this information, there's a concern that it would inhibit valuable testing. I just mentioned the many ways that clinical testing might be useful for personalized medicine. Um, we also want people to participate in research, and so there are concerns about protecting privacy for those reasons. So to do personalized medicine, you have to get the information, but how will this work? At the moment, the conventional method, to the extent we're doing personalized medicine, still very much in its infancy, somebody orders a test, interprets it, recontacts the patient to develop a treatment plan. This is reactive, this is labor intensive. This requires that the physician understand enough about genetics and the value of this information to order the tests in the first place. You could imagine something in the future that looks a bit different, where we collect a lot of genetic information preemptively. Maybe all the variants associated with pharmaceutical reactions, or maybe an entire genome sequence. Put that in an electronic health record and then use an electronic decision support system to try to guide treatment. So that when you try to prescribe drug X to a particular patient, you learn, oh, that wouldn't be a good drug for this particular patient. Now, there are a lot of privacy concerns with this. First, just having genetic information in the medical records means that that information is potentially accessible by many providers, um, by providers who might inadvertently collect it without any real need for that information. Also, when patients authorize the release of their records, say, to their employer after getting a conditional offer of employment, that genetic information might be included in the record. It's hard to segregate out the genetic information. Employers can't ask for genetic information. They're supposed to say, if we want the whole record, please keep the genetic information out, but it might slip in. Um, and then, if you want to use this, this decision support system, you need to have rich clinical data sets. You need computational resources to be able to make an accurate diagnosis. A lot of providers aren't going to have those means. So would providers find it beneficial to try to outsource patient data for that kind of analysis? Huge number of privacy issues raised by that. 
So we have had a number of privacy laws enacted in the last two decades. The states were very active initially, and eventually Congress um, joined in with the states with the passage of GINA, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. And the laws can be divided into sort of three approaches to protect genetic privacy. The first is to try to control access by requiring consent to get the information in the first place, that the patient would have to consent to the ge genetic test and to the analysis. The second way of controlling access is to require consent for redisclosure of the genetic information. This is really sort of like a property interest because you're controlling what happens to the information down the line. Um, and some states, in fact, state that you have a property interest in your genetic information. And then the third approach, which is the main focus of GINA, is to restrict discriminatory uses. GINA focuses on health insurance and employment, um, but there has been some movement on the state level to think about protection against discrimination by life insurers and also potentially disability or long-term care insurers. The goal of these laws is to try to encourage people to do the genetic testing that is potentially valuable to them. But how effective are these laws actually? A study was just posted on SSRN a few months ago by Miller and Tucker, and they tried to analyze the three approaches to see how that affected patients' desires to get testing. They had some interesting findings. They found that when you require consent to get the information in the first place, to do the test or to analyze the information, it actually deterred genetic testing. The anti-discrimination approach, however, seemed to have no effect on the desire to get testing. But requiring consent for redisclosure, the sort of property approach, actually encouraged genetic testing. I don't have time at the moment to explain their theories about why this might be so, but I think this is, this is an important finding, and I'll come back to that point at the very end. Okay, so now I want to switch gears to the research context very briefly. In order for, pharma, for personalized medicine to work, we really need to understand the molecular basis of disease. This means enormous clinical trials to study the role of genetic variants in disease susceptibility and responsiveness to drugs. It means the creation of very, very large databases that include both DNA or biological samples and genomic profiles. Now there are a number of privacy concerns with these databases. The first is that you've got stable and complete DNA. Even if it hasn't all been analyzed, it can potentially be analyzed for a great deal of information. In addition, to do the research, you need to link the genotypic data information about the genome, with the phenotypic data, information about observable traits like whether you react to a drug or not, and demographic data. Is that my time? Do I have like two more slides? Of course. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, so what this means is if you remove key identifiers, then you <coughs> potentially can identify these samples because of these linkages. Um, there are also very limited privacy protections. The state privacy laws, GINA, HIPAA, focus on identifiable information. And researchers have very broad, broad access to the data and biosamples if they're de-identified. But evidence is showing it's very difficult to completely de-identify genetic information. So my last slide. This, I think, raises a very serious question about whether we should require, at a minimum, notice and opt-out provisions or at least some kind of consent provision for use of de-identified de samples and genetic information. Um, there's the difficulty of de-identifying the samples. There's the fact that we have this study suggesting that consent actually encourages the testing we want to have done. Um, and finally, studies show that many people actually really want consent requirements for de-identified information. So thanks for the extra minute. Devin? I left the Center for Democracy and Technology, which means I no longer have the capacity to find my own <laughs> slides. Is it? Oh, I'm better than I thought. Okay, wait. I thought it was C view. It's in the lower right. Oh, you all are the best. Thank you. <laughs> Crowd participation and presentation. I love it. <laughs>
So I, I was tasked with the mental health piece of uh, what Professor Rothstein really is interested in. Um, and I, not that any of these issues are easy, but I think this one is particularly hard. Um, and recent news is all indication of just how hard this is. Um, I titled my presentation um, something around the title of a hearing that was held uh, by a House subcommittee not too long ago um, about whether HIPAA protections help or hinder patient care uh, and public safety. And so essentially my presentation is, is uh, going back through the presentation that I gave uh, to the uh, members of that committee, which is essentially that the conclusion, and maybe you will agree or disagree at the end of it, is that HIPAA strikes the right balance but that there's a lot of misinformation out there about what can and cannot be done with information that is causing issues with respect to um, patient care and public safety, and we're never going to get it precisely right. So my first slide is always about why it's important to be having these discussions, and it feels a little silly to even raise this at this conference in particular. Um, we know that if people don't trust the healthcare system, they won't go in and get care, and it's particularly important in the mental health context. I'm standing here in front of Dr. Peel saying this, and I feel almost sheepish, uh, duh. Um, you know, again, as many as one in four adults in a given year is suffering from a diagnosable mental health disorder, and nearly two-thirds do not seek treatment due to a range of reasons, but in, in part fear of disclosure and potential rejection from friends and discrimination. Um, so we do have protections in the law for mental health information. Psychotherapy notes under HIPAA um, are highly protected. They cannot be um, disclosed without the patient's written specific authorization, except in some very rare circumstances. But aside from psychotherapy notes, HIPAA generally treats mental health data just like any other type of data. But there are other protections um, that do apply. The um, federally supported substance abuse treatment programs are required to abide by a set of regulations called Part 2 which provide uh, that patient authorization is needed in order to share information that, that it suggests or indicates that the person uh, is a substance abuser. And nearly every state has recognized the role that stigma plays uh, in discouraging mental health treatment, and they've enacted laws that provide greater protections for mental health data. And those laws are not preempted by HIPAA. HIPAA's the floor, and these laws sit on top of that. So here are the common claims about HIPAA that were part of this hearing. It doesn't allow health information to be shared with friends or family. In fact, some people say it's not even allowed to be shared with you, the patient, <laughs> still today. Um, it doesn't allow healthcare providers to share information that's critical to public safety, and it really needs to be revised so that information about seriously mental ill persons can be more clearly shared with family members and to protect the public. And I've even seen legislation that actually if you have a certain diagnosed condition that's very serious, your privacy rights essentially disappear under HIPAA. That, thankfully, that legislation hasn't progressed very far. But um, again, <laughs> the events that have been occurring with people who are not successfully in treatment um, are putting an enormous amount of pressure on these rules and the very delicate balance that they, that they try to strike. With respect to sharing with friends and family, HIPAA allows providers to share information that's relevant to a patient's care with a family member or close friends that are involved in that care, except where the patient is objected. So the patient's choices reign here. Um, but if the patient has not objected, that information can be shared. And again, it's not the whole medical record, it's not the entire history, but whatever is relevant to care. Providers are, are able to infer that the patient wouldn't object based on the circumstances. Um, they can ask the patient if they object. There's no need for the written authorization that's required when HIPAA does require an authorization. It can be verbal. And they can rely on prior expressed preferences as well as the circumstances of the current situation. It asks for a judgment call, essentially, to be made about whether such sharing is appropriate. If the patient either isn't present or is unable to agree or even to object due to incapacity or emergency circumstances, the provider can disclose, again, to friends and family involved in care if it would be in the patient's best interest. And this is something that HHS covered in a lot more detail in some guidance that came out earlier this year. 
um, they noted that it could include circumstances where the patient is suffering from temporary psychosis or is under the influence of alcohol or if the patient cannot meaningfully agree or object to the sharing of information due to his current mental state. And then once the patient regains that capacity to make the choice, the provider should offer the patient the opportunity to agree or to object to any future sharing. So that in the moment, when the patient appears to the healthcare provider to be incapacitated and the provider makes a judgment call that that sharing is allowed, they do so. If the patient has capacity and objects, the information cannot be shared. Again, this asks for the healthcare provider who, in my opinion, is in the best position <laughs> to make the determination about whether that information should be shared and whether the patient that they are caring for is, has the capacity to either agree or object I think the one place where the guidance did not go into detail is what if you have a patient who is in, uh, who is having a psychotic breakdown or is under the influence of alcohol, but says very clearly to you, I object, I do not want you to share. Arguably, this guidance leaves room for the provider to make a judgment call that that person lacks the capacity to make a meaningful choice and to do that sharing. But I think the failure to sort of go that extra step in the guidance is, is unfortunate because I think providers are put in this position um, fairly frequently. They can also share for public safety. This has been in HIPAA all along. They're entitled um, to use or disclose information to avert a serious and imminent threat to health and safety, they're allowed to make this disclosure to anyone reasonably able to prevent or lessen the threat, including the person who may be the target of the threat, and they are presumed to be acting in good faith if they're acting based on either actual knowledge or credible information from a person with apparent knowledge or authority. And I'm reading these specifically because it gives a huge amount of deference to healthcare providers in making this determination. I think it would be highly unlikely that the Office of Civil Rights would find a provider to be in violation of HIPAA who made a reasonable good faith judgment that that information needed to be disclosed. And yet, I hear frequently concerns about liability and that's why this disclosures don't happen and it's just, it just boggles my mind. I don't understand. The, the, the guidance to me could not be more clear but it's not necessarily being all that well understood. Um, there are emergency exceptions in other, in the other <coughs> mental health privacy laws that I'm aware of, um, other than HIPAA. And here I just have a couple of slides dealing with the issue of access to firearms. Federal law already prohibits a category of persons called mental health prohibitors, which is probably the worst term I've ever heard mm -hmm. used in the law, from possessing or receiving a firearm. This is a very narrow class of persons. This is not anyone with a diagnosed serious mental condition. It is somebody who has objectively been determined to be incapacitated in some way, shape, or form. And I, I, I will put these slides up, I, you know, the um, patient privacy rights has them, but I'll also put them up on SlideShare, which is a publicly available site for anyone who wants them. Person, HHS has proposed a rule to change HIPAA to make it clear that if you are in possession of information that you know someone is a mental health prohibitor, you can disclose it to the, to the background, to the uh, database um, that the FBI uh, monitors um, and that gets checked when a background check is required in order to purchase a firearm or a handgun. So I think these are the issues um, that are relevant among probably many others. Does HIPAA strike the right balance? Leaving the judgment call to the healthcare providers and not making um, hard and fast determinations that X diagnosis equals no privacy rights. What is the likelihood that anybody's gonna be diagnosed with that condition if that's what the, the, the conclusion is? Um, the other thing is that HIPAA permits this sharing, sharing with family members, sharing for public safety, but it doesn't require it. So absent a state law requiring you know, a public reporting or a common law duty to inform in the case of, um, of a potential danger to others, it's not HIPAA that requires that disclosure again it is it is very deferential to the healthcare provider in making the right judgment call and the healthcare provider frankly has to balance what their professional obligations are but also the knowledge that this patient trusts them and may not come back to see them again for care if they disclose information that's a hard balance to strike but they're the best ones to make it in my judgment 
And if HIPAA does strike the right balance, is greater clarity and guidance needed? And how do we go about getting that guidance into the right hands? Thank you. Allison? All right, um, thanks. That was a, a great setup, actually, um, by the, the prior two speakers, because um, I think there's some themes that will uh, echo, resonate, whatever uh, we want to call it. Um, and the protecting health information, I'm, I'm caveating here, it's certain kinds of research. So um, I'll talk a little bit about what I'm talking about and what I'm not talking about. And I'm probably talking about a lot less than what I'm not talking about. Does that make any sense? <laughs> anyway, okay, so um, caveats and disclaimers. So the opinions expressed are, the, are those of my own. And I am neither fish nor fowl. So I'm not an attorney. I'm not a researcher. I'm also actually not a clinician. So I, um, you may ask, well, she's supremely unqualified <laughs> to be up there. So I'll give you a little bit of context for why I actually am here. Um, so um, my first job out of graduate school was for a health uh, healthcare consulting firm, and I was tasked with building um, health economics and outcomes models. And I had really lousy data as inputs, really lousy. So if it, um, a lot of the, the clients I was working with, um, you know, they may be asking questions or want to build models based on data that wasn't even asked in their clinical trials. It wasn't in the literature. So we would bring together panels of experts, um, very smart people, but a handful of people in order to build these models that were presumably being used to make really important decisions on behalf of our clients. Um, so fast forward several years, I was working um, at a consumer organization and this issue of health IT uh, you know, sort of came to the forefront. And it's actually when I uh, had the opportunity to first uh, meet and work with Devin. Um, and I kind of realized, wow, there's, there's gold in them, there are hills, right? For a lot of people, right? The individual, but also for all of the potential reuses that were available. Um, and so um, fast forward a few more years, um, I took a position with Academy Health, which is an organization that serves the fields of health services and policy research. And we really see ourselves as representing both the producers and users of evidence. And I'm an evidence-based kind of person myself, but I came there with some very focused um, ambitions. Um, or maybe not so focused, I'm not sure, but I wanted to figure out how we could move re the field of research forward by uh, leveraging some of the new and exciting uh, data sources that were becoming available through particularly electronic health records. Um, and I also wanted to bring the, um, the focus on patient and consumer engagement in, um, in research and in, in health IT activities uh, in general. So um, those are my caveats and I'm sticking with them. Um, <laughs> and you know, the, the reason for doing this is obviously to get to more relevant research, more rigorous research. There's a lot of, of, a lot of benefits of those uh, engagement opportunities. So um, in my seven year tenure now at Academy <coughs> Health, um, often serving as sort of a connector or a bridge function um, between various stakeholders, I can assure you that um, there's far more agreement than not actually um, that both researchers and patients and consumers all generally want the same thing, right? We want to use information to have better care, to learn, and to make evidence-based decisions and improve individual and population health. Um, that being said, there are some real um, you know, persistent challenges. And while we've seen some progress, um, we certainly have a lot more work in store. So um, a little bit more about sort of where I'm focusing. Um, research is big, so I'm going to talk about health services research uh, in particular, because that's sort of the home where I sit. Um, research done with electronic clinical data that's captured usually as a byproduct of the, the EHR. And I was recently at the Health Data Palooza, and, um, and uh, Atul Gawande referred to this as exhaust, which I thought was actually an interesting term, right, for secondary data use. Um, and then talking a little bit uh, specifically about where the rubber hits the road. So a lot of the challenges come when we talk about sharing information or accessing information. Um, so I'm just going to caveat that again by saying there's a whole lot more out there. Um, I'm focusing on you know where I spend my time at Academy Health, but this doesn't in any way diminish <coughs> all of the importance, enthusiasm, downright sort of exuberance that exists on all the whiz bang stuff. You know. Um, M health, big data, et cetera. But I know that there are people who are talking about that specifically 
um, in other sessions in the meeting, so I guess I'm going to be a little bit boring and old school. Um, uh, but I'm going to try to share a little bit about some of the pain points um, experienced by researchers in this very real context of privacy protection and some of the progress that we've seen uh, being made as part of the, the projects that we have the advantage to work with. So um, we are, though, just scratching the surface. So um, when I look at this pyramid of where we need to go in order to effectively use data to generate and act upon evidence, um, I'm always sobered by the fact that we spend so much time just at the bottom, <laughs> the data access part. Um, and to be sure, there are a lot of really important privacy considerations and other, quite frankly, uh, interesting considerations and challenges that we'll tackle moving up the pyramid. Um, but we still spend a ton of time on the data access portion. Um, and in the last several years, I've had the opportunity to serve as the co-investigator on something called the Electronic Data Methods Forum. This was an, an ARC-supported grant that was awarded about four years ago um, to a Academy Health, but our role was really, and our charge was really to engage a group of researchers who were all trying to build um, networks of electronic clinical data and use them to do comparative effectiveness research. Um, so they weren't asked to say, go do you know, your individual study in your own research institution. They were actually forced to work together and share data in order to do um, these really robust studies. Um, so it's with that framing that I, and some of that that I'll be sharing with you um, today. And invariably, the biggest challenges come with that, that sharing and that tension. Um, and there's always, you know, grousing about navigating, um, you know, regulations uh, for any kind of research study. I won't go into that, um, but suffice to say, it gets much more complicated with the sharing. So um, this next slide is just to emphasize why networked research is essential, um, because it really recognizes that because health and healthcare are really complex and encompass numerous data types and sources, as been pointed out earlier. Um, no single entity has all the data in one place or the different types of data that we might want. So it, to improve and to answer important questions, we really have to share. Um, and this is just a handful of a couple of organizations, some new, some not so new, that have in fact um, undertaken sharing. And then this is actually a much broader set, and I don't expect folks to be able to read the fine print, but we did this sort of landscape assessment of like, where are there activities where people are using electronic clinical data to support research and you know, broadly defined research? The right half um, of the you know, sort of, I guess, square um, is really the, the research domain. So I'm sure actually that when we um, first did this, it automatically became out of date because new things are popping up all the time. But it shows you that there's a lot of energy in this area. So um, the, uh, the other thing I'll say, um, as I mentioned, I'm not an attorney. And so I'm putting this up here purely to, to point out that we know, <laughs> um, and that uh, you know that we are we're aware, and we have heard from uh, the research community, and we've certainly worked with them um, to navigate a number of the federal regulations. And so I won't through uh, walk through all of this, um, but we we have um, worked with researchers um, as they've tried to share their data and uh, work across sites to answer key questions, um, and they basically you know for in, in gross terms and for for simplicity's sake, they have two choices, right? So if they want to leverage all of the data at their disposal, including personal health information, then that triggers a set of experiences having to do with consent and IRB, et cetera. Um, and if they are willing to work with de-identified or a limited data set, um, then that triggers another set of activities. Um, and we've done some writing, and a lot of that has been um, collaborative work that we've done with Devon, so there's just a couple additional resources for you. Um, but this has had very real implications for the health services researchers that we've worked with. Um, so, um, and, and I should point out, you know, obviously those regulations apply to any research, not just networked research, but the challenges um, are sort of amplified or, or exacerbated. So, um, sharing identifiable data, identifiable data for networked research is really onerous and hard to scale by beyond two to three sites. Um, if you're having to go through con individual consent and IRB and you know, you're know you really trying to draw data from a number of different sources, um, that's probably just not feasible in any grant period of funding, even it's sort of in generous terms, which is less likely these days. 
Um, but if you're sharing de-identified data or limited data sets for networked research, it's feasible, but there's still some challenges that the research field is bumped up against. And you know, given time, I won't go into all of them, but I'll highlight data linkage as an example. So um, you know, if you don't have key identifiers to link uh, multiple data sources um, and inform you know, critical research questions, particularly when you want to look longitudinally over time at the full patient experience, um, then you're really at a disadvantage not having um, those data at your disposal. Um, so that's all uh, a way to say it's not easy, um, sort of navigating the regulations, um, establishing trust, which I haven't really talked much about, and then working through the institutional and cultural barriers. Mm -hmm. All right, that's my alarm. Can I also impose on an extra? All right. Of course. <laughs> you said a bad precedent earlier, so. <laughs> um, so um, some coping strategies I just want to highlight. Um, you know, as I mentioned, for the last four years, I've been able to work with these research teams, and um, I, I can definitely say um, that there are some trends emerging and some things that they're doing um, that have tried to, you know, sort of make, make slow but real progress. Um, some of them are a bit, some of the ideas are a bit more ambitious, but um, I'll focus on a couple of activities that we've um, tried to help support um, in the recent years. Um, so one um, example of sharing promising practices is actually something that we worked on with uh, Devon. So um, with all of the researchers involved and even expanded beyond that initial set of, um, of uh, 11 different research projects, we've developed a governance toolkit. So if you have you know, sort of model language or processes or guidance that you've developed as part of your networked research experience, um, you can share that and hopefully other people will be able to use it and maybe even reuse it in order to um, you know, minimize the friction in the system. Um, and if anybody's interested, um, Devin's paper um, that she co-authored with Alice Leiter is referenced there. Um, we also, um, as part of the EDM forum, uh, support collaborative projects. One of them is actually on the notion of patient-centered portable consent. Um, and basically, it's, it's led by John Wilbanks at um, Sage Bio Networks, and he's basically trying to take a system that he's developed for um, networked uh, data sharing in another discipline and apply it to the field of health services research. So this is an initiative that we just started. Um, there's a, a meeting in June, and then and he's been doing some prototyping. But we hope that in the next several months, there are some research projects who've already sort of raised their hand and said they'd be willing to uh, to buy it to pilot test it, so that's encouraging. And there's a couple of additional resources for you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. JJ? Okay. Okay, first of all, I would like to uh, thank the organizers for inviting me. And now full speed ahead, <laughs> because, well, I don't want to eat uh, away too much time for questions. I would like to tell you about uh, a little tool that was designed to uh, protect data in research, especially in biobanking. But I think uh, it could also solve some problems outlined in this morning and maybe uh, tomorrow uh, in uh, protecting uh, health privacy. I first would like to uh, define the types of uh, categories of uh, data and samples of patients. Identified data are just stored with identity data coded are stored with a code, and then there is somewhere a key between the code and the identity data. Uh, along the lines of the talk of Peter Schar before lunch, uh, you could call that uh, pseudonymized. And then there is anonymous data, and there is no identity data, and you cannot link those data back to the data subject. When you have anonymous data, 
or patient samples from which data are uh, derived, the privacy is maximally protected. And in most countries, for those data and samples, there are much simpler laws, rules, and regulations to follow. So the question comes up, is it simple and simpler, and should uh, data and samples just become anonymous? But then you have the disadvantage that once you have anonymized and you cannot link the data back to the patient, there is no contact possible anymore. So then the question came up, can you build an anonymous system without that disadvantage? And you can. If you replace the identity data with what I call the bio pin, and that is a biological pin code, then the data become anonymous. There are no identity data anymore. But the features of non-anonymous systems remain. What is the bio pin? It's a pin code based on a distinguishing <coughs> biological characteristic of the data subject. There are no biometric data included, no phenotypic data, no diagnostic or prognostic medical data, no genetic data. It is unique for each person, even for twins or identical multiples. It is anonymous. It cannot be linked to a person. And therefore, according to the definition of the International Data Protection Convention, a biopin does not constitute personal data. How is it produced? Well, an anonymous individual provides a sample, can be saliva, blood, something else. And then in a laboratory, the distinguishing biological characteristic is determined. That is a data file. I don't want you to read or try to read all the information on there. It's a lot. It's over 99 kilobytes. That's a little bit too much. Mm -hmm. Then in what I call a biopin facility, because of data compression and an encryption step, it is brought back to the biological pin code, which is here depicted with less than 55 bytes. And by the way, the characteristic is unique in the sense that the probability that anyone else in the world has the same distinguishing biological characteristic is less than 10 to the minus 18th, which I think is sufficient. <laughs> And because the way the biopin is produced, it cannot be linked back to the underlying characteristic and therefore not to the anonymous individual. And to make it easier for handling, you can transform that into a 2D barcode, in this case a QR code, which probably most of you are familiar with. For instance, in a lab, you can put it on a tube, and that can be read. And of course, 99, where is my dot here? 99 kilobytes cannot be used for a small label. How are you using the biopin? Well, a patient in contact with a, cosp a hospital, then there are samples provided and data <coughs> exchanged. The patient could have his or her biopin produced. And then upload the information from the hospital or information from the patient, him or herself, for instance, lifestyle or other information that is not directly uh, derivable from a biological sample into a database. If the patient chooses to hand over his or her biopin to the hospital, then also the hospital, with consent of the patient, would be able to upload data anonymously, so anonymized data directly into the database, accompanied by the biopin. That would mean that from various hospitals, 
data could be brought together and linked. If samples are used for research purposes, then a comparable route can be followed, and then also the research data could end up in that database. That could be a database managed by the patient, him or herself, but it could also be a database managed in a biobank or some other trusted entity. Then the question came up that sometimes from the research, additional questions or follow-up cases are wanted, and then if the patient is anonymous, you would have a problem. So therefore, I devised an additional module in the BioPIN system, which allows, without lifting the anonymity, to send an alert message to the patient via a service provider in a special app to the patient to contact via the database or via the biobank or whatever, the hospital, the channel, the researcher and that also would allow the patient to ask questions. So what are the advantages? Maximum privacy protection. Safety. Your biopin is your biopin. You can always prove that your biopin is your biopin by having it redetermined. Sustainability. You only have, if you don't lose it, you have to have it determined one time in your life. It could make a personal electronic health record possible and then real personal, what you as a patient can manage and where you as a patient decide who has access to it. It strengthens autonomy. All your rights are protected. As I said, if lost, it can be reproduced. For those keeping databases, the advantage is also maximum privacy protection that can be offered to all your data subjects, which can enhance trust and engagement. There are no privacy protection costs. The privacy is already maximally protected. That means less regulatory burden because there are simpler rules to obey. Another point is there are no ambiguity in identity data. A biopin is a biopin and not a misspelled name. It makes international research easier because there are no impediments because of differences in, in uh, various uh, uh, privacy protection laws. The system is flexible and robust, which means that the same bio pin will allow to, uh, with the consent of the patient, of course, to be linked together from different sources. And of course, the uh, places where the data are stored can make different uh, agreements with the patient under what conditions uh, data are set, free or shared. And also there, if the biopin is uh, lost and there are samples still available of the patient, then the biopin can be reproduced. So in the end, the biopin offers maximum protection of privacy and other patient rights safety, robustness, and flexibility. It saves work, time, and money. And it is superior to other systems. People might think, why do you not use a random number? Well, if you use a random number, you can never redetermine it. So the biopin, in summing it up, enables a whole new way of data sampling, handling, in a new ethical, legal, and societal framework. And if you want to reach me, those are the email addresses. Thank you. I want to thank all our panelists for very interesting talks and for keeping on schedule. So we have some time to uh, have uh, some short questions and short answers. <laughs> Thank you. I'm really intrigued by the biopin, but I'm really confused by it too. What exactly are you measuring that's redeterminable that doesn't change over a person's lifetime? I assume from childhood to death at an old age. 
Um, a preferable uh, distinguishing biological characteristic would be a SNPs panel. Like what? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> single nucleotide polymorphisms, which are single letters. <laughs> Just, just a change, one change in the letter of the genome, one variation. Your whole the genome, genome, which is invariable. But it's not. The genome changes every day. Everyone's genome in this room changes every day. That's one of the problems with genomics. Our genome is not written in stone. It's rewritten, and errors are corrected and introduced every day and through the normal processes of DNA repair. So you're now telling that forensics based on DNA fingerprinting is nonsense? I didn't say that. I said your genome changes every day, depending what you decide to focus in on. You're not sure if you find a SNP, it's still going to be the same SNP 20 years from now. Yeah, but this is a panel of SNPs, so there is much redundancy in there, enough but redundancy. Hashing. But you're Sorry. hashing it down to 55 bytes. You're hashing it, so small changes may have big impact on the hash. Yes. So you're not going to get the same thing if there's been a tiny change. Just let me suggest another. I really like the idea. NSA and their contractors have come up with a voice print software that needs just three syllables and claims it can distinguish every human on the planet, no matter what voice-related disease you might have, as long as you still have a voice. So I urge you to look at that as another possibility. We could all have the same key code word, but we would all pronounce it differently. Whatever. I mean, the basic idea is a distinguishing biological characteristic. Uh, in, in general, not just with respect to biopin, but in general to the panel, what is the role of voluntary identifiers in, in this context of, of the panel? In other words, uh, could, would a person want to have separate identities for their mental health information mm -hmm. as a solution to the problem? Or would a person want to have multiple biopins uh, as a way of controlling the downstream uses of their anonymized data? Well, I, that would work. I mean, it's an option. It's, it's, I, I, um, we support that where identifiers are needed, and I say we is my old job. I guess the law firm probably doesn't have a specific position on this. I support <laughs> vol that patients have choice about identifiers when, when they uh, need to be used. But if there's not a concomitant policy requirement to ask for consent first, then the fact that you have a sort of established identifier that you've chosen doesn't necessarily sort of link you automatically into a choice controlled regime for sharing. What it does is reliably tell you that this data is about this patient, right? And you've, you're given some choices about that. So unless there's something I'm missing, it solves some pieces of it, but not necessarily all of the questions that have been raised. One last question. It's not exactly a question, but it's a concern. Um, I, I actually found all the talks really interesting, but but the thing that concerned me with the biopin is it's a unique identifier. It's attached to all of the patient's interactions with hospitals and so forth, and it's can link records across these hospitals. So the problem we have with anonymizing data and de-identifying data is that if somebody really wants to identify a particular record, they can use outside information and what they know about somebody to, to identify the record, and then they have your biopin. And so the notion of this persistent biopin that is unique to every individual sounds to me like the same problem we have now just using names. So, so and, and it's a lot easier to change your name than your nucleotides. So uh, how do you, <laughs> is, is this a problem you've solved in some way? Well, as I said, basically uh, the system was designed for biobanking and biobankers and, and in biomedical research, a name has no biomedical meaning. So no, for I research, it's not necessary. I can understand that a hospital needs to have a name and an address if only to send a bill. No, that's not, the name is not my point. My point is that by inference, using outside data, it should be possible to identify records. And once somebody has done that, they have your biopin and they can follow you as much as they want. I'm, I'm imagining a security issue. Yes, I, I understand what you're saying. But then you could, for instance, for an environment where they have your name or your identity, 
create a different biopin from an environment where it is not necessary to have your identity. And as was suggested, multiple biopins. So I uh, think you'll agree with me that we've just scratched the surface on uh, these three topics, and I look forward to uh, follow up next year, if not sooner. And please join me in thanking the panelists. So, if it is based on SNPs, why would you not have? Um, All right, uh, our our next uh, session <gasps> is supposed to be a bit more cozy, so we're getting some furniture moved around. So. Uh, Talk amongst yourself. Don't pay attention to what's going on on the stage here. Uh, so it's not okay.